Good morning, church. Welcome, welcome. It's lovely to see your lovely faces on this fine Sunday morning. Um, I'm not going to take too much time this morning before we get started into our time of praise and worship, um, but I did want to just quickly read um, a passage that has been on my heart, um, and this is James 1, verses 2 through 6, and it goes, Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking in anything. If any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God, who gives generously to all without finding fault. But when you ask, you must believe and not doubt, because the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea, blown and tossed by the wind. Um, so we had the pleasure of leading our life group through a study of the book of James over the past few months. Um, and even though we thoroughly studied and dissected every chapter that there was in James, this first line still stands out to me. Um, consider it pure joy to face trials of many kinds because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. And this stood out to me because I don't see these two states of beings as ones that are correlated. I don't consider trials and suffering in a series of tests as being something that's synonymous with joy. If I were going through these things alone from you know, my own perspective and my own understanding of the world, I wouldn't consider it to be a joyful time. I would see it as times that are filled with worry and fear and anxiety. Um, but luckily, we serve a God who reminds us not to lean on our own understandings of the world. I'm blessed to know God and, and to be able to lean on him in these times so that I don't have to go through these emotions that are not of him. Um, and I can come out of these situations with a stronger faith than before. Um, because we know when we go through trials, as we know, they're never just a, a one and done situation, you know? You go through something, you get through it, and then something else happens. Um, and this passage reminded me how the trials and tests of our faith that we go through aren't there just to prove that we can get through something, um, but it builds perseverance and strength in ourselves, but more importantly, in our faith in God and our trust in Him that He will be able to get us through this. Um, and trust so that when we come to God in times of our intercession, that we come to Him with that level of trust and not with doubt. So our prayers are prayers that are rooted in that trust in Him. So that the next time that we go through something, we are stronger and wiser and, and more refined than we were before. So that we may become people who are strong in our faith and have a faith like Job, where we understand that God is who He is and He is worthy of our praise, not because of what He's done for us and not because of our individual circumstances for that season, but He's good and He's worthy of our praise just because of who He is. Um, as we dug deeper into this passage and studied it more, I learned of the process of refining silver. Um, so when a silversmith refines silver, he puts the silver in a pot, he adds um, an incredible amount of heat to it, and at a certain temperature, at that high amount of heat, all of the impurities rise up to the surface. And then what he does is he takes all those impurities out and he runs it again. He runs the silver through, all the impurities rise up, and he cleans it out. And he runs it again and again and again until the silver becomes pure. And he knows the silver becomes pure because he can see his own reflection in it. Um, and so my prayer for all of us today is that as we go through our trials and our struggles and the testing of our faith through all of our seasons of our lives, that we may become more refined to the point where God can see his characteristics and his likeness in us so that our faith can become stronger every day and it's not rocked by the circumstances that may come in our lives. Um, so I'm actually going to invite you all to stand with us as we enter into this time of worship. Um, and, and my prayer is that we continue to lean on God in ways that, that we haven't before, that we lean on God in ways that are stronger than we have before, and we praise and we worship him in times of both sorrow and in times of joy. Um, so Father God, I thank you for this day that you've given us. I thank you, Lord, for, for speaking to us today. Um, I thank you, Father God, for your, your everlasting faithfulness that you've given us, oh God. I thank you, Father God, for being a good God, a good God not because of, of the circumstances that we're in, for 
um, for any season of our life, oh God, but I thank you for being a good God because you are a good God, oh Lord. I thank you for being a faithful God because you are a faithful God, oh Lord. I thank you for reminding us that you are great because you are great, not because of what you've done for us, because, but because it is who you are, Lord Jesus. I place the rest of this service into your hands, O oh Lord, and in your name I pray, amen.
trial, faithful through the night. Our God will never fail. Our God will never fail. Anchor through the flood, you keep holding on. I know you'll never fail, Jesus. You.
Jesus, thank you for being here for us, God. Thank you for being in this place with us, Jesus. Thank you for giving us so much love, Jesus. We can only pray that we can show others the same amount of love that you show us, God. We thank you, Lord, for forgiving us. Under any circumstance, Jesus, we thank you, God. The only thing that we could ever give you is our thoughts. I thank you for this time of worship, Lord. I pray for the woman of God that's going to speak, Jesus. We thank you, God, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Praise the Lord, church. Welcome to Christ AG Church. We're so excited to have you all here this morning. Those that are watching online, I know I don't look like Pastor Roman. Um, he and a lot of the church members are in Houston. One of our dear brothers got married yesterday, so almost half the church went to Houston. So I spoke to him this morning. He sends us greetings. He misses you guys. He's looking forward to being with you guys, with all of us next week. Um, just a couple of quick things. We have a few visitors here today. Sister Ingrid, welcome to church this morning. Uh, I think Dr. Jaslyn's mom is leaving this week. Yes, she's been worshiping with us for uh, a few months, and she's going back to India uh, this Wednesday. Wednesday, So keep her in your prayers. Hopefully we'll be seeing you again soon. Um, and this is a bittersweet Sunday for me. My husband and two of my babies are going to India as well this Friday, leaving me for some time. So I'm a little sad. So if you see me a little sad in the next couple of weeks, you know why. Um, so let's get into the word uh, this Sunday morning. Um, we're going to read Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1. For those that don't know me, my name is Anne. Uh, I'm one of the ministers here at Christ AG Church. I'm not a speaker at all. It's been a long time since I've been up on a pulpit, so bear with me. Um, but I do feel like I have a word for the church and uh um, so let's turn to Romans chapter 1. <clears throat> We're going to read 1 through 7 and then jump down to verse 16. Paul, a bondservant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated to the gospel of God, which he promised before through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures, concerning his son Jesus Christ our Lord, who was born of the seed of David according to the flesh, and declared to be the Son of God with the power according to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead. Through him we have received grace and apostleship for obedience to the faith among all nations for his name, among whom you also are called of Jesus Christ. To all who are in Rome, beloved of God, called to be saints, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Jump down to verse 16. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes, for the Jew first, and also for the Greek. So I don't know what brought everybody to church this Sunday morning. Maybe you are here for the first time. Maybe you've been growing up in the church. Maybe, you know, you're a children's church graduate, you know, like, you, you were just, that's how I was. I felt like I was born in the church. I, I gave my life to the Lord. I love Jesus then, and I love Jesus now. And, you know, why are you here today? And we get so excited when we hear testimonies of individuals that, you know, who were radically saved, who were, you know, lived that partying life, who were into, into drugs and alcohol, was going clubbing, and then all of a sudden God got a hold of them and they got saved. But I have a boring testimony. Right? I grew up in the church. I don't have anything exciting. Like, but we have to be excited about the, the mundane. We have to be excited about the, the being faithful and remaining in Christ. Because in John 15, it says, remain in me and I will remain in you. But that requires some work, right? Remaining in God and abiding in him requires a little bit of work. When I was in college, I was a part of InterVarsity Christian Fellowship, which a lot of our young people are a part of. And... Um, 
And I remember the staff worker at the time, uh, Jason, he took time to uh, pour into me and challenged me to have a deeper relationship with Jesus. And one of the things that he did was he handed me a book called Habitudes, um, uh, a faith-based art of self-leadership that form leadership habits and attitudes. Doing Christian things can be boring, but it builds character in who you are, and it builds things inside of you that uh, will get you through the hardest parts of life. Boring things. We, we, we tend to think, like, Christian things are boring. Reading my Bible is boring. Praying is boring. Coming to church early on a Sunday morning. I got three kids. It's hard. Coming to church on a Sunday morning. But we do it, right? Going, coming to church on a Friday night prayer. It's, I, Friday nights are the only nights that I have time to hang out with my friends. Sometimes it requires a bit of work, right? Creating these habits that God has given us that give us an opportunity to, to, to build that relationship with him. And I'm reminded of an old movie from the 1980s. This movie had a few remakes. It's called The Karate Kid, and a lot of you know the story. And there's an infamous line which says, wax on, wax off, right? But when the premise of the story is it was a young teenage boy, and he was getting bullied by some classmates or whatever, and they were part of a karate dojo. And this one moment when they were beating him up, Mr. Miyagi comes and he rescues them. So he asked Mr. Miyagi, can you teach me how to do karate? And he said, yeah, absolutely, I'll teach you, come tomorrow. So he comes tomorrow and all of a sudden, Mr. Miyagi is getting ready to teach him uh, karate. And what does Mr. Miyagi tell him? He says, I promise to teach karate, that is my part. You promise to learn, I say, you do, no questions. Deal, deal. So what does Mr. Miyagi do? Does he get his stance ready? No, he says, wash the car wax the car. Wax on, wax off. He's like, what? So he says, with your right hand, wax on. With your left hand, wax off. And he proceeds to spend the entire day washing, waxing on, waxing off. The next day he comes back, all of a sudden it's paint the fence. Up, down, up, down. The day after that, it was sand the, sand the deck. Go down right, go down left. Next was paint the, paint the house, side, side. So days went by and all Daniel's son felt like he was doing, was doing chores. All he felt like doing was the mundane, and he got so angry with Mr. Miyagi. He gets so frustrated with, with this man thinking, you promised to teach me karate. So he gets frustrated, and he's like, I'm done. I'm going out. So he's like, Daniel's son, come here. He calls Daniel, and he's like, show me wax on, wax off. And he's like, very, very, like, you know, whatever. And he's like, no, wax on. And he stretches, and he begins to tweak and refine the motions that he was practicing. Show me this. Show me paint the fence. Uh, no, stop here. He starts refining the movements, the habits, the, the mundane thing that he was doing begins to refine those tasks. And all of a sudden, Mr. Miyagi goes in attack mode. And all of the muscle memory, all of the motions that he was doing became his defense mechanism. In the moment of attack and in the moment of, 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 of a battle, Daniel all of a sudden started using the things that he thought was boring to win his victory. That is creating habits. When God says, read your word, pray, spend time in, your pre spend time in my presence, come to church on Sunday, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. My, your rod and your staff are... These things that we do, that we think are mundane, these things, these verses that we learn, we think that are mundane, but God says, no, I am refining. I am refining you. I am creating a defense mechanism that when the enemy comes at you, I will defend. You are built to defend. You are built to, to be on the attack for what the enemy is going to come at you. We need to create good habits. There's a quote by Bruce Lee. Fear not the man who has practiced 10,000 kicks once, but fear the man who has practiced one kick 10,000 times. One kick 10,000 times is greater because you begin to build muscle. You begin to build not just doing hi, 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 hi. That's not. It is literally doing the same motion, reading my word, going through it, studying the word. What is God teaching me? What is God doing to me? It's hard work. This year, the Lord challenged me to start reading my word a little more. And with my job, I, I get early enough. I'm on the train, and I'm reading a little bit more, and I'm studying God's word. 
And sometimes we look at the Bible and reading the Bible very intimidating. We think like, oh, it's so the language is too hard or, or I don't know where to start or I don't know where to begin. It's so many different stories. But the Bible is one story. It is one story about a God that loved and created a humanity, but we were so disobedient and we turned away from him. And the entire Bible is about a rescue mission, about a God who loves his people and is on the rescue to bring his people back to him. I heard a pastor um, talk about the Bible as this. The Old Testament is the anticipation of Jesus. When he comes. When he's coming. He's coming soon. When he comes. The gospel is the presentation of Jesus. Jesus is born of a manger. He's walking on earth. His physical presence on the earth. Acts is the continuation of that which Christ started. He says, tag your it to the disciples. It's your turn. To walk in the power of the Holy Spirit and to do greater than what he did. The epistles, the explanation of, is, uh, sorry, the epistles are the explanation and clarification of what Jesus did. Revelations is the consummation of Jesus coming to us and joining with him as his bride. Now we get to Romans. That was just my intro. Romans is, the, is an apostle, apost, apostle sorry, of Paul, and one of the greatest epistles ever written in the Bible. He writes to the Christians and the believers of Rome, and as he writes, he's writing to a people that are, are sitting in a very powerful nation. They are one of the most powerful at the time. And he's teaching them about the ABCs, about the, found, the fundamentals of what it means to be a believer, what it means to believe in Jesus, what it means to forgive, what it means to, to be justified, what it means to, to walk in grace. He explains all these things and explains uh, everything that Jesus did on the cross. If you want to know about the will of God, you should read the book of Romans. If you want to know about the wrath of God, you should read the book of Romans. If you want to know about the plan of God, read the book of Romans. If you want to know about the grace of God, read the book of Romans. If you think you know everything that you need to know, if you think you have the, the Bible memorized inside and out and know all the little the, the nitty-gritty details about it, think you don't need any of this, read the book of Romans. For it says, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. If you feel like you're not good enough and that you think you're deep in your sins, read Romans, because it says, for there is therefore now no condemnation to those that are in Christ Jesus. Maybe you're struggling with how you can be in the world, but not of this world. But Romans says, I beseech you therefore by the mercies of God to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. Be no longer confirmed, be no longer conformed to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Maybe you're worried about something going on in your life, in your family, in your work, in your finance. Read Romans, because it says, God will work all things together for the good of those who love him and who are called according to his purpose. Maybe you feel alone. Maybe you feel like nobody's got your back. Maybe you feel like there's, it's just you. But God says in the book of Romans, if God be for us, then who can be against us? That is the book of Romans. It lays the foundation of us as believers to know what it means to walk with Jesus, know what it means to, to, to have a relationship with Jesus, creating habits to, to know who he is, creating an understanding of, of, of wanting to know and have that relationship with God. Paul was a brilliant man. He was educated, he was competent, and he was very committed to the cause. He, in fact, was committed before he was even converted. He was a Pharisee, and he was killing Christians, or, yeah, killing Christians. He was so committed to what he believed was the truth that when he understood what the truth was, he was even more committed. Sometimes we feel like I, 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 I'm so passionate about certain things. I, I can do certain things and you think like, oh, you know, God can't, God can't do anything more. But when you feel like you're not on God's radar, God has you on his radar. So now let's go to Romans 1 where we started. It says, Paul, a bond servant. The word bond servant or ser servant actually means slave in the Greek in this passage. 
So the difference between a servant and a bond servant is two different things. A servant, you would serve a person's house, but you would also have your own house. You could clock in and clock out. You could, if you didn't like your master, you could actually change your master. And that's a, that's a servant. But a bond servant, they knew that they were purchased by their master. They have no rights. Everything they had belonged to the master. So it's interesting that Paul uses the word, uh, Paul, a bond servant of Jesus Christ. He understood that he was purchased with a price, that everything that he did and everything that he had and who he was was not of his own and that it, was all, it all belonged to Jesus. My question to you is, are you a bond servant or are you a servant? As a Christian, do we just clock in on Sunday and clock out on Monday? Do we give everything that we have to God? Or are we completely committed to the cause? Do we just say, all right, I'll just do my Sunday morning. I'll just, you know, is it just a routine for you to be here? Do you say, okay, this church is not good enough. Let me go to the next one. Oh, this, this, you know what, God, God I, don't, I don't need to get up today to, to, to go to church. I can, or are you committed to the cause? Do you know who has bought you? Do you know who has purchased you? Do you know, are you a bond servant or are you a servant? Why are you here today? What brought you to church today? Is it because you have that relationship with God or is it because I just got to do my time? Like we go into work, swipe in. At the end of the day, swipe out. Is that, what, is that what God has called us to do? Or does he call us to swipe in and stay swiped in? That when the going gets tough, the tough get going. That even though life struggles come my way, I'm going to keep going. I'm going to believe in the God that called me. I'm going to believe in the God who's, who's, who's been there with me from the beginning. <laughs> Being a mom, I feel like I see God in the everyday moments. When, you know, I thought there was going to be Sunday school today, but it's a little trouble. Um, my kids, when, when you try to tell your kids something, it's the, the, the fight back. And I think all the moms and the parents are laughing because I think it's true because when you tell your kids to do something and it's when they don't do it or they throw a fit and it's like, is that me, God? When you tell me to do something, do I throw a fit? It's like, can you eat your food? Can you do your homework? Can you take a bath? No, no. And it's like... Do I sound like that to God? Do I sound like that to God? Do I sound, if God tells me I want you to give generous, generously, I want you to go pray with that person. And I'm like, no. But do I sound like a whining child? And in these moments, I, I think, okay, God, I, I need to know how I act before you. Because I know when you tell me to do something, it means different than when somebody else tells me to do something. There is a great children's show that I'm a big fan of, um, called Bluey. And like I said, in the everyday moments, God speaks. And if you have young kids, you probably know Bluey and know the show. If you don't, I recommend you to watch this particular episode if you can. It's called Show and Tell. And as I'm watching this, so mind you, it's, for, it's a kid's show, but how many parents out there have watched Bluey, even though your kids are doing something else? And I'm watching this show. And it's the episode, it's, it's, it's a dog family. It's a mom, dad, and two daughters. And the dad, in this particular episode of Bluey, the kids are getting annoyed with their dad because he's bossing them around. And in the episode, he's like, go eat your breakfast. And they're like, you're bossing us around. You're telling us what to do. And so they ask their dad, why do you always boss us around? You always say, do this and do that. And so then they begin to start counting the amount of times that their dad bosses them around. Do this, that's two. Do this, that's three. And they start counting. So now their dad has to run an errand and have to go somewhere. And as they're, they're, they get in the car, they put the seatbelt on, the dad puts the GPS on, and the GPS starts going. And so the dad's talking to them. Oh, he said, put our seatbelts on. That's 10. They're, they're literally annoying their father and counting the amount of times that their, quote, unquote, their dad is being bossy, right, bossy. So all of a sudden, out of frustration, the dad begins to stop listening to the GPS. So he's like, the GPS guys go left, and he's like, no, I don't want to listen to you. I don't want you telling me what to do. I'm sick of it. So then the kids say, you can't ignore the GPS. It's trying to get you where you need to go. If you ignore it, you will get lost. He keeps ignoring and finally ends up at the, in a dead end. Okay? 
and the kids see where they are and they yell, statue world, is this where you need to be? Dad says, no, I think I'm lost, what am I going to do? The kids respond, you have to listen to the GPS, even if it's bossing you around, it's doing it for good reason. Watching this as a parent, so innocently, portrayed on a screen when they say statue world, do you know what statue world is? A cemetery. And it's super innocent, like don't think it's like, oh, morbid. It's not, it's very innocent in, in the scene. But here they are, the father gets lost, disobeys the GPS, and ends up in a cemetery. And God smacks me in the face. God can speak through Bluey. And says, when you follow your own will, and you are disobedient to what I tell you to do, where will you end up? Bluey. I got this from Bluey, right? This is something that we grew up with our entire lives, right? And they're laughing because, oh, the dad's being annoying or whatever. And I'm like, oh, God. Like, you know? And, and, and it's funny because God speaks in, the, in the, the little moments that we have with him. In your everyday, if you don't see God in the everyday moments of your life, what kind of relationship are you having? If he's not talking to you every single day, and I have watched that episode over and over again, I laugh and then I smirk and I'm like, all right, God, I get it. And, you know, we, when God tells me to do certain things or expects me to, to do the, the questionable things, and if I'm walking in the disobedience of the GPS, the God's positioning system, moving me further and further away from where God has called me, I will ultimately end up in my own grave. He will call you to places and things that you are not comfortable going. But know that he has a reason for it. Paul, a bondservant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, he was not sent out of his own will. He was not sent out to do his own thing. But he was called. It was never his deal. He never, he was okay with doing what he was okay with doing. But when God called him, he was called to do the crazy things. You think Paul wanted to be in prison? Do you think Paul wanted to be shipwrecked? Do you think Paul wanted to, to do all the things and go through everything that he went through? No, but he was called and he was set apart. He was a bond servant. Being a bond servant requires you to do things that you don't want to do. We jump down to verse 16. It says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God. Not it has the power, the gospel, it is the power of God. If the, gof if the gospel is my power, I better know what the gospel is. The power is connected to knowing what the gospel is. What is the gospel? The actual definition is good news. It is the good news. It is not good advice. It is not a good thought. It is not a good, it is the good news. It is, it is, it is something, the image that, that is portrayed here is a battle that is being fought. And in the battle, there is a, a herald. And the job of a herald is once the battle has been won, they had to run into the village with all of their strength and announce, guess what? We won. We got the victory. We are no longer under the oppression of our enemy. That is the good news. That's where we get Romans 10 verses 15 where it says, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. The people are standing and waiting in the village. They're waiting to hear what is on the other side of that battle. They're waiting to hear. And as they see the herald running, or not running, if the herald is walking slowly and downcast, they knew that they lost the battle. But if the herald is running with all its might, and if the herald is, 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 is excited, they look at the feet of the herald and they see, it's good news, it's good news. What is the good news that we have? We were stuck in our sins with no hope of redemption. Sin blocked our connection to God. But Jesus came down from heaven, being fully man, fully God, died on the cross for you and me. This is the good news. He won. We got the victory. We are no longer under the oppression of our enemy. 
For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. I'm going to call the worship team back up here. We should not be ashamed of this gospel. Knowing that what Jesus did on that cross knowing that we carry the good news of Jesus Christ, knowing that we have this hope to share with a lost world that are in anticipation of wanting to hear some good news. The good news of Jesus died for me. Jesus loves you. We have won the victory. We believe in a God that has done this, but why do we walk so downcast? Why do we walk like we're defeated? Why do we walk like we have no hope? But we as believers of God and we as children of God, we have this hope and we have this understanding of knowing that we are victorious by the blood of the Lamb, that we are victorious for what he did on the cross. That is the good news. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to our salvation. The gospel gives us power. The gospel is our hope. The gospel is the thing that we need to be so sure about. Do you believe in this gospel? Do you have this hope in Jesus Christ? Do you know this Jesus Christ? I wasn't going to do this. But with every head bowed and every eye closed, if you want to know this Jesus, the one that has won the victory, the one that has pulled us out of our sin, the one that has, has died on the cross for you and I, the one that has loved you and still loves you, even in your, your lowest moments, that Jesus. If there is anybody here who's never accepted Jesus as their personal Savior, and if you are saying, I want to accept you, Lord. I want to know you. I want to have a relationship with you. I want to know what it means to be your son or your daughter. You could raise your hands. Maybe you grew up in the church. Maybe you've lost your way. Maybe you're not sure where you stand with God. Maybe you've clocked in and clocked out time and time again. And maybe now God is asking, are you ready to be a bondservant? I challenge you to don't just clock in and clock out. I challenge you to build habits, to build a community of people around you, to build a relationship with Jesus Christ, and to know that he has a plan and a purpose for your life.
rise to our feet. I'm up here to uh, close the first service, um, but also to uh, make a very, a very heavy and sad announcement uh, to the church this morning. I'm sure uh, some of you, if not many of you, may have heard uh, the news that one of our dear sisters, uh, her name is Joyce John. Um, uh, Joyce and her husband, uh, John, they attend uh, mostly the second service. Uh, and so for those of you that only attend the first service may not know her personally, but uh, we just found out last night that our dear sister went to be with the Lord. And it has been shocking, to say the least, unexpected. Uh, they have a son. His name is Caleb. And so I just wanted to share uh, that news with the church this morning and ask you all to kindly remember that family, um, Brother John and, and Caleb, in your prayers, if you can, for strength, for peace, for courage. It is tough when unexpected things happen. Um, my kids were asking, you know, who, uh, who this, this auntie was, and I, I told them it's the auntie that sits on the third row to my left, to your right, uh, with her husband every Sunday, and she's the auntie that jumps up and down during worship and worships the Lord without any fear of what other people are going to think or any boundaries. She's the one that's screaming and jumping and raising her hands up and down. And, and now she is in the presence of God doing the same. There are certain spots where people sit, if you've noticed, every Sunday. Like this spot right here in the second row at the end of this seat will always be Sister Jolinda's spot. She's another dear sister that actually passed away here at our church during worship service. That spot will always be Sister Joyce's spot. And as much as it pains and it hurts for us to, to think of and uh, we need to um, try our best to remain strong and pray uh, for the family as well. So I just want to share that with the church this morning. I'm going to end our service with a word of prayer. Dear Jesus, Lord God, thank you so much for, for being here this morning, for your presence, oh Lord God, that is always with us, that goes with us. Thank you for your Holy Spirit that resides in our hearts, Lord. Thank you, O Lord God, for speaking through your daughter this morning, Lord God Jesus. Thank you, O Lord God, for the GPS, Lord. For your, your, your service, Lord God Jesus, that you extend to us, O Lord God. Thank you, O Lord God, for leading us just like a GPS would, Lord God, as we heard today. And sometimes we deviate from your voice, Lord, and sometimes we fall back, Lord God Jesus, from what you are saying to us because of our distractions, because of our weaknesses in our lives, Lord. But I pray this morning for anyone that may have fallen away from your, from your words, from your grace, Lord, that they will return to you as a sheep to a shepherd, Lord God Jesus. Father, I speak on behalf of all of us, including myself. I ask for forgiveness, Lord. I ask for forgiveness, Lord God Jesus, that we will come back to you and your throne of grace, and you will lead us and you will guide us again, Lord. Father, thank you for helping us understand that your gospel is the true power of our salvation. And I pray, Lord God, that we, we will hold on to those words this week, Lord. That your word, Lord God Jesus, will sustain us and the bereaving family, Lord God, this week. Sometimes as we go through the valleys of our lives, Lord, 
A simple word from you is enough. And I pray for a word of comfort. I pray for a hug, Lord God, that you will give Brother John and, and Caleb this morning. As hard as it may be, Lord God, as much as our minds cannot wrap around the wise, Lord, I pray that you will lead them, that you will guide them, that you will be their source of comfort and peace at this time, as only you can, Father. As only you can. We give you all the glory, honor, and praise. We pray for those that are that are traveling this week, our pastors, Lord, and their families. I pray that you will be with them as they return back to New York, Lord. Please keep them safe. We give you all the glory, honor, and praise. In your precious and mighty name we pray. Amen and amen. And as, as, uh, as hard as it may be to, to say this sometimes, we still have to, and we have to believe it when we say it. God is good, and all the time. Amen. May God be with you.